Transverse myelitis is inflammation which traverses the spinal cord, and in this video we're going to take a look at anatomy of the spine, the subtypes and causes of transverse myelitis, what it looks like on MRI scans, and the treatment along with other diseases that mimic transverse myelitis. And remember what the Buddha said, knowing others is wisdom, but knowing yourself is enlightenment. This is a sagittal image of an MRI scan looking through the cervical spine like this. Here you can see the brain stem, the bones or vertebrae of the spine, the discs in between. Here is the spinal cord and this white area represents a lesion consistent with transverse myelitis in the back or posterior of the spinal cord at the C2 level. We'll look briefly at the anatomy of the spinal cord so we can understand the symptoms of transverse myelitis. This is a cross section of the spine like this and note that this is reversed of how it appears on MRI scans. So this is the back of the spine and this is the front of the spine. Sensation comes from the dorsal columns, fine touch and vibration sensation, and the spinal thalamic tracts involved in sharpness and temperature sensation. The lateral aspect of the spinal cord, the right and left, contains the corticospinal tracts or the descending motor fibers, so injury to this area causes weakness, along with the frontal horn. The center of the spinal cord contains nerve fibers in involved in urination control. We can also see in this longitudinal section that there are a lot of sympathetic nuclei in the mid-thoracic spinal cord and below, so injuries higher up can cause autonomic or unconscious nervous system symptoms such as changes in heart rate, goosebumps, sweating, and other unusual symptoms with severe injuries. Symptoms of transverse myelitis usually develop subacutely over days to a few weeks, as opposed to other disorders such as metabolic disorders or spinal cord tumors where symptoms are usually very chronic over months to years, or trauma or strokes of the spinal cord which are usually very acute over minutes to hours. The common symptoms are weakness of the limbs, numbness of the limbs or trunk below the level of the lesion. Bladder symptoms are very common such as having to go often, urinary frequency, or straining to urinate, urinary hesitancy. Sexual problems such as erectile dysfunction are common along with autonomic symptoms that I mentioned earlier, though they're often unrecognized. Some Sometimes transverse myelitis is classified based on the severity of the symptoms or the appearance on MRI scans. For example, if the symptoms are mild, such as only sensory symptoms, it's sometimes called partial transverse myelitis. If there are severe deficits below the level of the lesion, such as paraplegia, it's referred to as complete transverse myelitis. Usually with diseases such as multiple sclerosis, the lesions are very short, only one or two vertebral segments. If they're longer, three vertebral segments or more, it's referred to as longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, as in diseases such as neuromyelitis optica. Sometimes the white matter is spared and it primarily involves the center of the spinal cord or the anterior or front of the spinal cord where the motor neurons are, and that's often called gray matter-centric transverse myelitis, as in conditions such as polio and acute flaccid myelitis. There are many different causes of transverse myelitis. Sometimes it can be a uniphasic or one-time event and never occur again, and sometimes it can be part of a chronic autoimmune disease. Some examples of one-time events are when it happens after a vaccine or after an infection. The idea here is your immune system sees a foreign antigen, like from a vaccine or from a virus, and something about the proteinaceous structure of that antigen resembles part of your immune system, and it triggers an autoimmune result. This is kind of a fluke idiosyncratic event, and it usually would occur about 10 days to 2 months after after the inciting event, and it usually does not recur even with future infections and future vaccinations. Sometimes it can be idiosyncratic, meaning we just don't know the cause, it just happens, and sometimes it can be part of a chronic disease, the most common by far being multiple sclerosis, but it's also associated with other autoimmune diseases of the nervous system, such as neuromyelitis optica, or myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein associated disease, or MOGAD, or sometimes it can be associated with another systemic autoimmune disease such as Sjogren's syndrome, lupus, or Bichette's disease. There's a disease called ADEM or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis where you get inflammation of the brain and spine spontaneously, more common in children, and sometimes transverse myelitis can be caused by an infection. Usually when it's caused by an infection, the symptoms are a little bit more rapid onset and severe, and some common causes include cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster virus, HIV, which actually causes a vacuolar myelopathy where you usually don't see a lesion, just atrophy of the spine, 
Lyme disease, herpes, or bacteria such as listeria. Now, there's a lot of variation in the severity of transverse myelitis. Sometimes it can cause symptoms such as numbness in the legs for a few days and resolve spontaneously, often in autoimmune transverse myelitis, for example, can be very mild. Sometimes it can cause no symptoms. A lot of people with multiple sclerosis have lesions of the spine, but no symptoms corresponding to that spine lesion. And sometimes transverse myelitis can be very severe and cause permanent neurological deficits. It just varies a lot. Now let's look at some MRI scans of different causes of transverse myelitis. So the MRI I showed earlier of the C2 lesion was in someone with multiple sclerosis. In this condition, lesions are usually present in the brain, and that's why an MRI of the brain is generally recommended in someone who has transverse myelitis because this is by far the most common chronic autoimmune disease which causes it. Here you can see these T2 bright ovoid lesions typical of multiple sclerosis, some of which take up the contrast dye. My whole channel is about multiple sclerosis, so feel free to take a look at some of my other videos. This is an MRI of someone with neuromyelitis optica. This condition often causes longitudinally extensive lesions, again lesions that cover more than three vertebral segments and you can see there's patchy contrast enhancement. This is a rare autoimmune disease happening in only about 1 in 20,000 Americans, and it can often cause these very long, severe lesions that often involve the center of the spinal cord. This condition can also cause optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve, and sometimes lesions in the brain as well. In about 70% of cases, people with this disease have abnormal antibodies in the blood called anti-aquaporin-4 which is the cause of this disease in many cases. As I said, people with other autoimmune diseases can also get myelitis. This is a person who has lupoid myelitis, or uh, lupus associated with inflammation of the spinal cord, and this often also causes longitudinally extensive lesions. You can see this T2 bright lesion here in the cervical cord. Historically, many cases of lupoid myelitis were actually neuromyelitis optica because those two diseases are often associated with each other. I don't know if this particular individual had anti-aquaporin-4 antibodies. This is someone with neurosarcoidosis. You can see this contrast-enhancing lesion here in the lower cervical spine. People with sarcoidosis often have dural involvement, where you can see the inflammation comes from the dura, or the meninges, the coverings of the spinal cord. And this is a systemic disease. One of the other symptoms is enlargement of the hilar lymph nodes. You can see this particular individual has some enlargement and increased uptake on FDG PET in the hilar area from the lymph nodes. And it's very important to make a correct diagnosis because this disease is treated with other medications. For instance, TNF-alpha inhibitors such as Humira can make MS and neuromyelitis optica worse but can actually treat sarcoidosis. Sometimes the cause of transverse myelitis is very obvious, such as in multiple sclerosis where the MRI of the brain shows clear lesions typical of that disease but a lot of the times it's less often. So we need to pay close attention to the pacing of the symptoms and other symptoms in the body that could clue us in as to the diagnosis, such as ulcers in Bichette's disease or symptoms of other autoimmune disease, such as lupus or Sjogren's syndrome. Often we have to do a spinal tap to try to figure out the cause, and these are the typical findings in immune-mediated transverse myelitis. In other words, in diseases such as multiple sclerosis or post-infectious or post-vaccination transverse myelitis. Generally, there's an elevation of lymphocytes, a subclass of white blood cells. Normally, there are less than five per microliter. In this study, in immune-mediated transverse myelitis, there was an average of 38 per microliter. In diseases such as multiple sclerosis, it's usually a little bit lower, such as 5 to 15. Generally, the protein is elevated. Normal is 15 to 45 per deciliter. In this study, the average was 75. Usually, the glucose or sugar is normal, and culture for routine infections like bacteria is generally normal. There are specialized tests in the spinal fluid to look for causes such as herpes, CMV, or varicella. This is a study looking at transverse myelitis after vaccination, and you can see the different types of vaccinations to the left, and they did statistical models to see if the rate of transverse myelitis was higher after these vaccinations. 
Overall, the odds ratio was 1.1, which means a 10% higher risk of transverse myelitis after vaccination, but this was not statistically significant, and there was no clear signal that a particular vaccine causes transverse myelitis, although we do think it can be a cause of transverse myelitis in rare idiosyncratic cases. Next, we'll move to treatment of immune-mediated transverse myelitis. So the typical treatment is steroids to suppress the immune system and calm down the inflammation in the spinal cord, and the most common drug used is intravenous solumedrol or methylprednisolone. A very high dose of 1 gram or 1,000 milligrams is used daily for 3 to 5 days. An alternative is to give the same drug orally, and sometimes we can't get large tablets of methylprednisolone, so instead we'll use prednisone, 1,250 milligrams orally daily for 3 to 5 days. This is 25 50 milligram tablets, and it turns out that it's probably equally effective if taken properly. Now, high-dose steroids can damage the stomach and sometimes cause ulcers, so we'll often give protection to the stomach in the form of an acid blocker, such as Pepsid or Protonix, and sometimes we'll give a slow taper of steroids afterwards just to continue the treatment for a little bit longer and come off of steroids slowly. Now, for people who don't recover after steroids, there are other treatments. One alternative is plasmapheresis or plasma exchange. This is a dialysis-like procedure that removes abnormal antibodies and other immune factors, hopefully reducing inflammation of the spinal cord. Typically, we do five treatments, often every other day, just to give the body a break. For some people with very severe transverse myelitis where these treatments aren't working, we'll use other stronger chemotherapy drugs. One regimen I've had some success with is cyclophosphamide, or cytoxan, one gram per meter squared, monthly for six months. For instance, I have a patient who had neuromyelitis optica with very severe cervical spine myelitis who is quadriplegic and dependent on a ventilator, but eventually recovered and was able to walk, though she did have some residual neurological problems. So there is hope even for people with very severe transverse myelitis. Now, of course, if myelitis is caused by infection, it can be treated in a different way, such as using antibiotics or antiviral agents. Sometimes steroids are also given to reduce inflammation at the same time. And these are just a few examples. This is a 40-year-old man who has transverse myelitis due to CMV, cytomegalovirus. Usually this happens in someone with a weakened immune system, such as AIDS or organ transplants, but this is actually a 40-year-old healthy man with a normal immune system. This is a 79-year-old woman with varicella myelitis, and you can see the lesion here. And often, this is associated with zoster, or shingles, and you can see the rash consistent with shingles. And sometimes they happen at the same time, and sometimes people can have myeloridiculitis with this condition. And in other words, they can get inflammation of the lumbar nerve roots at the same time. And these diseases are treated with antiviral agents, and like I said, sometimes steroids are given at the same time. Now, not every spinal cord lesion is transverse myelitis, and sometimes misdiagnosis occurs, and I just want to show a few examples of other diseases that could mimic transverse myelitis. So this is a spinal cord infarct, or stroke of the spine, which is rare, but it can occur, particularly in people who are older and have other vascular risk factors, such as diabetes and hypertension. Sometimes this can occur after a specific procedure, such as aortic surgery or a bronchial angiogram. And here you can see there are certain sequences of the MRI such as diffusion-weighted imaging that can prove this is a stroke. There are cases where people are diagnosed with transverse myelitis and have plasmapheresis, and there's a temporary drop in blood pressure which can actually worsen the stroke. So it's important to make a correct diagnosis. This is a syrinx, or enlargement of the normal central canal, which contains cerebral spinal fluid. This is usually milder, but can cause symptoms such as pain and temperature sensation loss, and sometimes neuropathic pain. The way to recognize it is to see the signal of the syrinx is the same as the cerebral spinal fluid on all sequences of the MRI. Sometimes metabolic diseases can cause spinal cord lesions. This is someone with subacute combined degeneration. degeneration of the back and lateral columns of the spinal cord. Here you can see the lesion, and it can be caused by things such as B12 deficiency, copper deficiency, or nitrous oxide poisoning. This is an example of a spinal cord tumor, in this case a meningitis, excuse me, an ependymoma, 
opening the central canal, which can cause slow onset of symptoms and neuropathic pain. This is actually a genetic condition called hereditary spastic paraparesis, and the finding here is a posterior or back location of the central canal with dilation. This condition causes very slow onset over years, weakness in the legs, and spasticity or increased muscle tone. So if you've had transverse myelitis, please share your experiences in the comments below, and I'm happy to field any questions and suggestions for future videos.